I'm your host, Rob Carbone. This is BD4. understand the um, whole idea that it's not an elite team that we just swept. It's the Tigers, right? So it's not anything crazy. But you know the what we wanted what I wanted was for the Yankees to just have some kind of launching pad, if you will, type of series. Where we don't give a shit whoever it is they face, but just win. Right? We'll worry about the elite teams, who we can beat, how we can beat them later. Right now, we're just trying to get back on track. We're just trying to get back to 500. Boom. Did that. Now we're trying to get back at the top of the division. And so any way you can do that, whether it be the friggin' Tigers or the LA Dodgers, I'm, I'm all for it. So I'm not going to sit here and spend, you know, whatever it's going to the hour discussing how, you know, I'm not buying into anything yet. I'm not going to waste my time on that because I get it. I, it's to me, this was a stepping stone. This wasn't OK. The Yankees are back. No, this was OK. The Yankees are getting back on track. Right. It was OK. This is this is. We're 15 and 15. We just finished up the month of April and well, a couple days into May. And, you know, now we can start talking about beating the better teams because we've got Houston coming up. We've got um, Washington coming up. We've got Tampa coming up, who aren't really special, but they're decent teams. They're not the Tigers. They're not the Baltimore Orioles, who we headed into this series losing to them, right? Two out of four. So. It was that was what this was supposed to be about for me. This wasn't supposed to be about getting the Yankees back on top. It was just supposed to be about getting them back on that track that they derailed from to start the season. And you know, fortunately, we're back on that track. It looks like you know we're playing clean baseball. We are not fumbling the ball all over the place. Um, well, I guess you know, barring Clint Frazier's. <laughs> Botched pop fly in the uh, the first the first uh, play of the uh, second game, but for the most part we're playing good. You know, we're getting by defensively. We are pitching great on on you know both the, you know in the bullpen and the bullpen continues to do their job and the starting rotation has been giving us a lot of length lately. And then you look at the lineup. The lineup has finally awoken. Um, it seems like, right? We are averaging about six runs in the last six games. Um, so, or I'm sorry, the last two series, last seven games. It's about that. So, it looks better. And so we needed a series like that, whoever it would be against, to get better and to, and to, start, to start looking like that. All right? So I'm not going to nitpick. I'm going to take it as it is. Um, you know, we can't, we can't pick our schedule, but, um, what's, what's, what's going on, everybody? Hope everybody's doing well. I am your host, RJ Carbone. This is episode 241 of the podcast. Yes. Episode 241 of BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. I hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to the show. Um, gonna try to keep this you know within an hour i usually like to do it an hour maybe a little more hopefully i can keep it under that because it's pretty late as i'm recording it is you know the middle of the night past sunday may 2nd so it's technically you know one in the morning on may 3rd so i gotta get to bed 
I got to put this up, edit it, get to bed. And, you know, Monday morning, I've got class in the afternoon or got to get ready in the afternoon for class later. And then, um, yeah. So as you're listening to this, it should be May 3rd. Uh, but as I'm recording, technically, oh, it's the same day. But we're going to go May 2nd as I'm recording um, because it's few hours past midnight an hour and change past midnight of sunday so hope everybody's doing well i am your host rj carbone this is episode once again 241 of the podcast of bd4 if you haven't subscribed to the show be sure to do that right now you can subscribe to us on uh you know apple podcast spotify soundcloud youtube where you can watch the podcast you know we've got the video version up there um, and many more. Just go to you know my website. Um, you can go. You can find the podcast feeds and and the blog. You know I write the blog on the Yankees and Knicks every game, and the podcast I'll do the Knicks every two games, Yankees every series, and you can also find me on social media. All that stuff you can find on my link tree. So go to link dot. Oh, sorry. Go to link tr. Link tr. Dot ee forward slash rj carbone once again. If you want to find all that information, go to linktr.ee forward slash RJ Carbone. All right. So welcome to the show. If you're new here, well, you should subscribe right now. If you are not new, welcome back and thanks for coming back. I appreciate every one of you who do tune into these shows. Um... Yeah, the Yankees swept the Tigers. They are back at 515 and 15. Um, I don't know if they're third or fourth in the East. I have I want to say third. Maybe better. Gonna check right now. But you know, things are looking better. It's you know. Let's see. How does it not say okay, third in the AL East. Yeah, I mean it's not even like a it's a tight tight race still because like the the Red Sox surprisingly Boston's doing really well this year but you know they're 17 and 12 they're nothing special so that's fucking sustainable we're two and a half behind them we're one game behind the Jays so yeah you know it's a big series coming up against Houston I'm sure they're gonna get a lovely ovation at Yankee Stadium um and that's you know that's that um we might as well get right into the series, um, but this episode, we're not just going to recap the series and break everything down. We're going to have a little bit of a progress report after we analyze this three-game set, which again resulted in a sweep. So hopefully we can keep it under an hour, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, let's head to our first break. And when we get back, we'll start this thing up. We'll recap the series. We'll discuss some things. And then we'll get right into the progress report where we will go over each player um, individually and give them, you know, their grade for the first month of the season. All right, so let's head to our first plug. Be right back. Hey fellas, so really quick before we get back into the show, I do want to remind you that if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast or subscribed to my blog or followed me on social media even, you can do all that by going to my link tree. Just go to linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. That is linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. Guys, thanks so much. Let's get back to the show. You know, this game one was kind of like the first game that you really saw the Yankees come out and break out this season. Now, you had the 7 nothing in, what was it, Baltimore? But this was one that really felt like everybody was clicking on all cylinders. You know? 
everybody was going. You had a bunch of home runs, a bunch of hits, a little amount of strikeouts, a lot of walks. It was good, and the Yankees won this one 10-0 at Yankee Stadium. 15 hits, exactly. 10 runs. All of them are RBIs, so they all came off the bats. Um, five walks, five strikeouts, which was very, very good to see. And every spot in the order got on base at least twice. Huge. Uh, you know, you started the game off in the first inning. Gio Urshela, the RBI single. one nothing Yanks. Clint Frazier gets, you know, the monkey off his back. Um, I think that was, was it this, his first home run? Or, I think it was his second, though. Whatever. He gets a home run, goes to left field in the second inning. 2 nothing Yanks. Then you have Judge and Hicks in the same inning. In inning number three, they go deep. Um, obviously, a few at-bats apart. 4 nothing Yankees. Um, and then Judge goes deep for a second time against Buck Farmer. Buck Farmer. I've always loved that guy's name. I mean, and you look at the guy. He's like the stereotypical name. His face fits his fucking name. It's exactly what you would eat. Buck Farmer. Like He looks like a, a redneck. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Judge gets the grand slam off Buck Farmer. Um, this is, the, I think it was their first pitcher in relief. Um, I can't remember who they tossed. Scubro? Scubro? I can't say his name. Uh, but the grand slam basically puts the game away in the fourth inning. Yankees just on fire. The first time, they, or maybe the second time, or very, very little have they scored in the first inning this year. So it was good to see Gio do that. And then Judge kind of putting the tack on. Not the tack on, but the... Um, you know, the game put away, or if you want to call it that. He puts the game away with the Grand Slam to make it 8 nothing. Attack ons come with Hicks' RBI double against Garcia in the um, later in the in the inning. And then in the fifth inning, you had Odor with the solo shot to make a 10-zip. Probably his first Yankee hit that wasn't in a big spot. Um, so, again, it was nice to see them score early for a change. Um, and then, you know, once they put the game away... You had DJ, uh, I think Torres, and then in the outfield you had Judge getting off their feet, sitting the rest of the way. So, and then and you, you had Garrett Cole just shoving it for six innings pitched, zero earned runs, 12 strikeouts, two strikeouts per inning on 87 pitches. You strike out 12 batters and you only need 87 pitches? That's freaking phenomenal. I mean, that is hard to do. My thumbnail right there. That's hard to do. Um, I gotta get my thumbnail for for YouTube, so I needed to do a little pose there. But why? Like, that's impressive. He was. I know it's again. It's Detroit. I don't want to spend the whole episode saying, but it's Detroit, 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 Detroit. But like, it was impressive. You know, we, it's Garrett Cole. We know he can do this against anybody. It was cool. Um, only 87 pitches. I was. I wanted him to go seven. Why not use him to save the pen? You know, if this is like... Garrett Cole days are supposed to be the days where you give your pen a rest. He was only at 87 pitches. Yes, it was a 10 nothing game. I get that. He was at 87 pitches. He wasn't at 107. If he was at 107 through six... Sure, you set this, you set him the rest of the way, but he was at 87. You let him go back out there for one more, and then you see what's up. He was cruising. Nobody was touching this guy. I don't know, but um, whatever. He was great. He was ridiculous yet again. Didn't use the slider much. Every game he kind of seems to have a pitch that's working, but he went and attacked with his heater. Um, you know, killing it with the fastball, the curveball was great, uh, and he was brilliant mixing in that changeup once again, which, again, you have to point to Matt Blake for optimizing the changeup. You know, all these Yank all these guys are, are, are throwing their changeups a lot more and becoming a lot more um, effective with it. And so Garrett Cole was great there. Then you went to Sessa, Peralta, Litke for the rest of the, the game. Three innings, six Ks combined between the three of them. Um... One second here. We're like freezing up. Okay. Yeah, it was 
Licky struck out the side one, two, three in the ninth. Uh, and then you had Peralta before that making his Yankee debut. Um, you know, threw a bunch of changeups. Uh, I think we only saw one or two of his fastballs, but he was at 95. This is a guy who we kind of talked about it last time out. The Yankees like because, you know, their analytics team says he does all the things that you want. He spins it fast. He's got a good high velocity fastball with the spin rate. He's got a good curveball and he's a lefty. So we'll see. We can get some untapped potential there. That was game one. The Yanks take the 10 nothing victory. Game two wasn't as much of a blowout. It looked like it was going to be. Um, but the Yankees ended up picking the sixth, uh, picking. What was I getting at there? Picking the 6-4 victory? The Yankees ended up... Seriously, what was I going to say? Picking? What word did I get lost on there? Oh, picking up. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. The Yankees ended up picking up. The Yankees ended up picking up. Fucking all over the fucking place. The 6-4 victory. Um, another good offensive performance. He had 8 hits. 6 runs in total. Um, 6 walks and... Again, only five strikeouts, so they were putting the bat to the ball, keeping it in play. Um, so aggressive, but staying inside the zone and jumping on whatever pitches they needed to jump on, capitalizing on any mistakes. Um, and in this one, they did not need the home run, much like Game 3 as well. The Yankees didn't need the homer to win this. Uh, it was in the third inning where Torres put them on the board, singling through the right side of the infield, and... Puts him up one nothing. Beautiful approach there by Torres. He wasn't trying to swing for a five-run shot. Just when he has that clean approach and he's focused, that's what he's using all fields. And, you know, he's a kind of hitter where he has the talent to where even if he doesn't get his best swing off, he has such good play coverage to where he could still pull off a hit. That's why I always thought he could be a 300 hitter, but... It's far from that right now. Hopefully he can find his way. He's swinging the bat better lately. It was a good night at the plate for Torres. Starts him off one nothing. Then you get in the bottom of the inning, or the top of the next inning rather, um, in the fourth. You have, you know, Tyone hangs that slider to Candelario. And that's a solo bomb one on one tie game. Uh, but then Judge, another big night. He gets the big double in the fifth, puts the Yanks up two to one. That was the inning where DJ stole second and then advanced on the wild throw to third. Um, and then Judge later on the big RBI single to put them up four to one in the sixth. Um, from there, Torres another big hit in the sixth inning. He gets the two run single. That's six to one Yankees. Looks like they're going to cruise their way to a victory. Justin Wilson struggles. Chad Green gives up the uh, the the solo blast and then um, that was after Lasagna looked pretty good. They they struggle, and then the Chapman comes in. He's pretty filthy again, and it doesn't matter in the end. So, good win. Offense looked fine. Tyone <clears throat> won five innings, um, just one run, eight strikeouts. Did a nice job versus Turnbull there. Um, but he was good. Once again, he was working the high heat. You know, it was the high fastball getting him out of those jams, especially that fifth inning where he, you know, he got Miggy with the heater high. It was a little outside. It was like really high in the zone too. A couple of times, um, you know, the inning starts off. Good room with the single. He then stole second. Uh, Griner lines out. Then you get Jones singling to third, but Goodrum going from third, second to third, gets hit with the batted ball. He's called out. Uh, but then Tyon issues two walks to Grossman and Castro. So the bases are loaded for Miggy. Um, and he got him to K on the, on the high fastball. So I love the high fastball attack that Tyone has. And again, this is Blake, Matt Blake, working with Tyone to try and get him away from the sinker that he used to throw and go with the high heat. And it worked. And it's been his best pitch this year. It's been his top pitch in the arsenal he has. But eventually he's going to have to add in another pitch. Um, you know, I hope that the off speed catches up. There's not a ton of slider action right now. The changeup is, again, a lot of guys are throwing it, but Tyone doesn't throw it a ton. Um, so I'm hoping he can kind of optimize on the changeup or the slider, get the curve working. He's got a good shape to his curve. Um, something, but you know, it's going to have to be a little bit more so this time he can kind of get through these 
you know, navigate through lineups the second and third time. Because we see this often when the lineup flips, Jameson kind of starts to struggle. You know, he'll put traffic on the bases and he'll get himself into a jam. He's done this a bunch of times where he starts out the game really strong, really promising. Um, was it in Cleveland the other day? And then he kind of falls apart once the lineup flips over. So something to keep an eye on. But all in all, a good win for him. You know, it was his first win in exactly two years. Like exactly from that day, it was two years. Awesome. He got the belt in the clubhouse. Um, it was a very emotional day for him. So it was good to see that. Um, this was the game where Michael K was kind of singing praises to uh, to Clint and to Gary. It was it the fourth inning when they were both running hard on those ground ball outs? <laughs> Which you could clearly see. You can clearly see the Yankees are sprinting down the line and hustling now ever since that second game of the Atlanta Braves series where, you know, Glaber, Glaber was kind of called out. So you see it. But it's like Kay was literally just singing their praises the entire half inning. Just, you know, may as well bake them cookies. Like, he, he it's kind of their jobs, guy. Like, it, it's kind of, they're supposed to hustle. I'm not going to praise you for hustling. That should be something you do automatically. Hustling is not a bonus. It's, it may seem like it's a bonus because the Yankees have such a hard time doing something like hustling when they shouldn't. But like he was, yeah, he was going on about it. Like, oh, they're doing such a great job hustling. Like, yeah, uh, you're kind of supposed to, <laughs> especially when you're trying to get back to to where you usually are, winning. You know, when you're not winning games, it's loud when you're not hustling. So <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Um. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not, listen, Kay's cool. I'm sure he's, he's, you know, he's, he's obviously good at his job. I'm sure Cone, they're tough to watch and listen to sometimes, you know. They were talking about the automatic strike zone and the robo ums coming, which it got me thinking. Um, this isn't robo ums but like, you know how they have that box, that strike zone box, the graphic, while you're watching the games? It's like, we always complain, oh, that's a strike, but we see it. Like, having the box there, like, we we now hold these umpires to such high freaking standards because we have that graphic up all game. And we can clearly see with that box if the ball's in the box or out of the box. And if it's slightly out of the box and the ump calls it a strike, we get on him because we see it. And, like, we hold them to these super high expectations now because we can see it. It's like, I noticed that. Like, before they started putting that box there every play, like, Yeston, Yeston used to have that. It used to be just ESPN. Yes, didn't have that. And when, when it was like that, I, we never, like, I never did. I was never like, that's a strike, that's a ball. But now it's, like, excessive. Now, like, anybody who's in the room watching with me will jump on the first, very first second. They see something that they don't like, some kind of call outside the zone that should be inside or inside that should be outside. Outside, They're fucking jumping on the up. It's like, yeah, because we see it right here. It's much harder and more, much more difficult to do it while you're in the action behind the plate without the graphic. Fucking always find that funny. Um, Yeah. While we're on my pet peeves, one of the annoying, the most annoying things, as a pitcher myself, who's, you know, I, I pitched my whole life, I always hated it, but you see it all the time in baseball, in Major League Baseball too. Excuse me. You see it all the freaking time and it pisses me off. Guys constantly, constantly doing this. They're, they take their shit off. They go to their shin guard and they take it off before the ump makes the call. They think it's ball four. 
they go right to their shit. Now, some of it probably do it to persuade the umpire and to put pressure on them, but it is the most frustrating thing because we had one guy on Detroit fucking, I forget who it was, but the guy freaking walked halfway down the line and then I guess he heard it was a it was a strike and he casually walked back like such an attitude. It's such an annoying thing to me. And if I like oh man. Like that that kind of fucking entitlement that that you deserve you deserve Oh my god. Like I I would stick one right in your fucking ribs if you did that to me. That's that's how I'm going to say it. I can't stand that, dude. I can't stand it. And I had to deal with that plenty of times. And I hated it. I freaking hated it. Listen for the umps call first. Then you can go. Don't do it before you hear the ump. Because they clearly do it on purpose. I'm telling you. They're doing it as some kind of persuasion. You know, to, but it's just like, dude, chill the fuck out. It's literally a split second. All you have to do is wait one more second, a half a second even, to hear the umpire's voice. Then you can go and do your shit. But don't take your shit off before he even makes his call. Oh my gosh. I Hying in, right in the ribs, wherever, something needs to happen. Like, I can't stand that shit. And I forget who it was. Maybe it was their catcher, but somebody did it. Somebody did it. Took his shin guard off in the middle of a call. And it ended up being a strike. It was a strike. He thought it was ball four. Pisses me off. Pisses me off. I did like one thing um, when I'm watching the telecast. Cone brought up a really good point. Uh, something I agreed with for once. Out of his mouth. Talking about fear factor. And... You know, how, like, even though even though Miguel Cabrera is, you know, kind of washed up at this point, just his presence, him, st- like, that batting stance, just him, knowing him, knowing he's still Miggy Cabrera, he's got a history of winning triple crowns and MVPs, and he's clearly headed for the hall, it still scares you. Like, when you watch your pitchers pitch to him, I still have that fear factor. He brings those... Fearful vibes. I don't know about you guys, but whenever I watch, even like no matter how old he's going to be, it still scares me. It's like, this is Miguel Cabrera. He could let one go 450 feet at any time. Even though he's probably not going to, it still brings those vibes. And I was watching this game and that inning where, again, Tyone was in that bases loaded jam. And I'm like, oh shit, this is Miggy. All it's going to take is one hanger. And it could be out of here. <laughs> I just I just found that pretty funny. You know, he was saying that. And he was saying how, like, Ricky Henderson, even in his later years, when he would be on first base, David Cohn would still kind of be jittery. Like, he's going to steal. He's going to steal. Even though he was in his, his older years. I fucking, fucking love that. Because I always think about that. I always think about it. And I always say it's so true. It's called fear factor right there, man. It's, you, don't, you don't have to be young. Just the fact that you have developed such a scary resume, that's always going to stick with people. And I'm sure pitchers think that way too when they're on the mound. I did. I always do. Did. That was game two. Um, Yanks take a, a nice victory. Game three was probably the, tell you was, the tightest game of the series. Um, but the Yankees figure out a way to pull it out. So the Yankees take a 2 nothing victory in this one. A, a pitcher's duel, right? It wasn't exactly... Whoops. What the hell just happened there? Was... Whoa. I got the logo right on here. Wasn't exactly the offensive... Uh, one second. Sorry. Wasn't exactly the offensive onslaught, but wins are wins. And the Yankees picked up a 2 nothing victory. Kluber versus Urena. Uh, a pitcher's duel. Bottom of the second, Kyle Higashioka, the RBI double down the line. Then later on, you get Brett Gardner, the sack fly. Um, and that was that was the offense for, for both sides. That was it. The Yankees picked up the 2-0 victory. Corey Kluber was the clue bot. He was money, dude. He was, oh man. 
Eight innings, eight innings, no runs, 10 strikeouts, 103 pitches, which I was at first shocked that they let him throw that many bullets. You know, being that Cole, 87 pitches couldn't do it. But somebody like Kluber, 35, two years removed from his last season. Then I thought about it, and it's like, well, you know, this guy, the it's... They have him for just one year, Kluber. So why not get all they can? So they're probably just going to be riding him a lot. When he's on, I expect them to ride Kluber. Because he's only here for one year. You're getting the rest of what he has left in the tank. Whereas Cole, you have him for nine years. Um, and you know you need every bit of him to be healthy. So I understand. Um, but yeah, he was great. Um 30-25 with the sinker and the changeup, the amount of pitches. Um, so he was mixing it up. Mixed in the cutter, too, but I thought the changeup was phenomenal. It complemented that sinker very well. Um, batters were 1 for 11 against his changeup, so I thought he did great. He was spectacular. He saved the bullpen, man, which is great because you now have double off day. Um You've, you've got double off days with today being that he won eight and then he handed it to Chapman and now tomorrow is an actual off day. So you've got two off days in a row for the pen. They're going to be fully rested for this Houston series. Um, so it was a good win for Kluber. Earned his 100th win of his career. So, yeah. Good series. It was good to beat this team. Um did what they were supposed to do. I would have not taken two out of three. If they took two out of three, that to me would have been a huge upset, especially after only splitting in Baltimore. Um, but they head back home. They pick up the quick sweep. Um, and this is the start of a nine-game homestand for the Yankees. So lots to come. Big series for Aaron Judge. He had eight ribbies in this one. He had two home runs. Obviously the one grand slam, his second of his career. Um, is he good? Is is Aaron Judge back now from lower body stuff, or are we gonna are we gonna load manage him some more? You know, it gets me thinking. How many games do you think we'll even see with um with Aaron Judge on the mound on the uh, on the mound with Aaron Judge out there? Do you think he's gonna get one forty five? Hopefully, that's that's my minimum. I hope he can play at least one forty five. You know. But the way they're trying to load manage him and the amount of times he gets injured, I'm I'm nervous. It's little shit like this. And they held him out for a couple of games earlier with the oblique. Now it's lower body stuff, whatever the fuck they want to call it, from travel, from running the friggin' bases, from baseball shit. I don't know, man. Hopefully he's healthy, he's good now. Stanton, Stanton's been hot. Three games in a row where he had three hits. Um, obviously, before the rest day in between, why are you resting your hottest hitter? I don't know, but they won. They won it. Um, something satisfying, man, about seeing A.J. Hinch go from win a World Series champion team in the Astros to the basement-dwelling, bottom-feeding Tigers. Something satisfying. It's like Wall Street to McDonald's, right? Oh, it's so satisfying. And he got a nice ovation all three games by the Yankee Stadium crowd. That was fun. Speaking of, they're going to open back up. They're going to be opening back up on July 1st, 100% capacity. And you bet I will make a game this summer. As long as it's not $6,000 for nosebleeds. Um... I was listening to John Boy a little bit earlier, part of his podcast, and he was saying, and I thought I heard it on the telecast, I may have, but he was saying how Judge asked to be the three hitter. He's been asking to be the number three hitter for a few years, and Stanton has been asking to be the two guy. I thought that was crazy. If they're asking to be there, and you're not doing it, you know what that says. I mean, that just continues to show that these players, even Stanton and Judge at that, hold very little weight 
they carry very little weight when it comes to that because you know it's all about what the nerds say upstairs so if even them two can't even have any say and this has been going on for years it continues to scare me it really scares me how much they're bitched around by their you know nerd camp who sent down these reports <laughs> it's like but um, yeah, good series. Uh, Miggy Cabrera was one hit shy. Was he one hit shy from tying or breaking? I think he was one hit shy from breaking, from breaking Babe Ruth's record. Uh, not record, but hit total. Uh, but he never got it, unfortunately. He's a he's dude. He was one of my favorite players to watch back when he was in his prime. Man, he was again. He was a triple crown machine. He won it one year, and I think he was close the next year. Oh man, he was fun. But time flies, dude. It really does. All right, so this is uh yeah, we're about a month in. You know, the first month is is through, and I want to go over some progress reports. I I did a progress report on pitcher by pitcher in the rotation. I wrote uh did a progress report on the bullpen as a unit, and then I want one by one in the lineup around the diamond. So we're going to go over all that. And then after that, we'll get to the MYY question of the day. The MYY MYK question of the day. And then we'll wrap it up from there. So let's head to a break. And when we're back from break, let's dive into this report card or this progress report. So I want to get this out of the way first before I even go to it. So the way I did this, um, and don't kill me because I know people get really sensitive when it comes to like report cards and grades and progress reports. So the way I did it, I based these expectations off of that player's, I based these grades off of that player's own expectation. So one player might have similar stats to, as another, but he might get a different grade because he's expected to do more or less. Make sense? All right, but um, we'll start with Garrett Cole, which I, I'm pretty sure the guy fucking A+. Plus. I mean, four in one record. He's got a 143 ERA. I think I heard somewhere he's got a war of 1.7, if you like that. Um, but what I think is just absurd, what is comical stupid just stupid is 62 strikeouts versus three fucking walks just laughable laughable i mean 62 strikeouts in 37 and two-thirds innings versus three walks he doesn't walk anybody he just strikes them out instead which i think it's a good strategy <laughs> to me, guy is so fun to watch pitch. He's a, he's an artist. Michael K says that all the time, and he's right. He's an artist. He loves to perfect his craft. He uses the media as like a therapeutic session. I love the way he goes about his game, dude. He's so interested in everything. He's a monster. He's a monster. He's the best pitcher. Um, I feel like we take this guy for granted. Like, I don't know what, to, what am I supposed to, like, do I, I need, I need to absorb it more. I don't know how to do that. I need to absorb it more. He's so good. And he had a good season with the Yankees last year, but this is the call I expect. Like, something like, this is what we're paying for. And of course, he's got to do it in October, but so far, so good. So far, so good. So I gave him an A+. 
Uh, we go to Corey Kluber. Two and two with a three oh three ERA. Now this 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 is a small this is where it's an example where the small sample size can kind of skew those numbers. Because you look at two and two with the three oh three, that's like okay, he's been somewhere in the you know high B category. No, I gave I've gave Kluber a, a C plus, right? Don't you know, again the eight innings, zero runs, and then the six and two thirds innings. His last time out, those were so good that they kind of manipulated those numbers a bit. But you remember his first four starts where he could not escape the fifth inning. It was a rough watch. He didn't look sharp, you know. But these last two starts, he's kind of riding the ship a bit, right? He's definitely riding the ship. Um, and, you know, they're against weak as fuck lineups, the Orioles and the Tigers. So we got to take that into account. But C plus so far. If Again, if it was based off of his last two starts, you couldn't go less than an A plus. But so far this season, I, overall, the big picture, his, what, six starts? A C plus. Jamison Tyone. Um, yeah, he's been inconsistent, man. He hasn't been able to go very deep into games. Um Two outings where he's gone five. That's been his best yet. Still got to see more. Um, he's, you know, I think a fair grade, a very fair grade, would be a C. A flat C. Um, I think that's fair, to be honest. I don't think that's too harsh or too optimistic. A C. You know, so far he's been exactly mediocre. He's got to be better. And he's looked better. He looked better last time out. The game before that, he looked really sharp until he fell apart again when the lineup turned. But yeah, we're going to have to see more outings where he can pitch, you know, to a quality start at least. And I don't think he, he doesn't have one quality start this year. He's got, you know, a couple of five inning performances. His best outing was his most recent five innings, one run in game two. But um, yeah, C for Tyone. Jordan Montgomery. I gave him a B minus. You know, he's a quality pitcher, a good number four. He's had some decent outings. Um, doesn't stray from his norm a ton, does he? You know, if you've watched this guy since he's been a Yankee, most of his outings are about the same, which is good. Consistency is good. You know what you're getting. You know, he's about six innings, maybe five innings, two or three runs, maybe four. Around that norm, around that area. So he's been a quality pitcher, a decent number four, exactly what I expected Jordan Montgomery to be. Um, he's being so I gave him a B minus. I think he's been the second best starter on the staff when we're talking about consistency. It's like what time is it? 2 21 a.m. on Monday, and I hear like fucking motorcycles outside. Domingo Herman. Uh, C plus for Herman. Uh, again, I think he's riding the ship as well. It's fun to watch him pitch lately. Um, it looks like he's coming around. Not much else to say there. He's, you know, he started out rough. He was demoted after two rough starts. Um, but then he's come back up and he looks a lot better. Um, the big thing with him is always command. Is he wild inside the zone? If so, he's going to get hammered. Does he have the command? He's going to figure out a way to get through at least six strong for you. And so the last couple of outings, he's done that. But again, need, some, need to see some more. Right now, C+. Um, you move to the bullpen. I gave the bullpen an A. They've got the second best ERA in baseball at 239. Um, so much better than what I expected them to be. So I've got to give them props. I mean, I was I was ripping them. Enter in the season. And it, we still have a lot of time left. So who knows. But you know I was saying. You know Britain's one of your only top arms. He's not going to be there. Chapman I was saying. Chapman looks like he's on the decline. I was saying how. Justin Wilson is an average journeyman. Who's not going to give you anything. I was saying how. Johnny Lasagna has been very. Much of an enigma. How I'm not expecting him. To suddenly break out. I was saying how Chad Green has kind of been average to okay. I was ripping them. Darren O'Day is, you know, I was making fun of his age. I, 
I got it. I got to Yeah, I was making about Licky, who's this random guy who hasn't pitched in five fucking years. But they're all contributing. There's not one guy in the pen. Sessa's even p- pitching really well. There aren't. I don't think there's one guy in the bullpen who has been really bad. Who has been bad? They've all been good to great, and that's why they've got the second best ERA in the game. They've been amazing. So you know, guys are holding it down right now without Britain, who's obviously a mainstay. Um, but yeah, they've been good. Now Darren O'Day. Um. It was just announced that he will be out a while with a rotator cuff strain. So that's unfortunate. Aaron Boone said it was kind of bothering him all month, but he didn't say anything because he felt he could pitch through it and he didn't know it was serious. But he's going to be out a bit and they called back up Michael King. So that was good. I think King, it was before the 10 days. So his service time actually counted. So that was a good thing. So he'll be back up here. Um, and he's obviously been fantastic, Michael King, scoreless in every inning he pitched. Knock on wood, um, but that happened. So, yeah, bullpen and a, I, I can't complain about them. Um, let's head to break again. When we get back, we'll go over this lineup and give out our progress report. All right. So I guess we start with catcher, and we'll work our way around. I don't know. We'll just, yeah, we'll kind of just play it by whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, Gary Sanchez. Um, we'll start with Gary. I gave him a D. He's been pretty shit, man. Um, he started the season with a few decent games, a couple home runs in the first few games. Was hitting the ball somewhat decently for a while. But then he fell apart. He He's given them nothing. He's given them nothing since the first, I don't know, week or so. And he's even been benched for it. He lost his job last year in the playoffs to Kyle Higgy. He's already lost his job a month into the season to Kyle Higgy. I mean, this guy hasn't shown much promise. Um the defense hasn't been a problem yet. Although, does anybody else get crossed up more than him? I mean, I wish there was a stat on cross-ups. Because I feel like every time this guy catches, there's at least one or two per game. Oh my gosh. But the defense hasn't exactly been... I think he only has one pass ball, which happened in this series. Um, because of a, uh, of a cross-up. But um, again, hustle still seems to be an issue with him. He... He's had a few instances with that already. You know, twice in one game, I think, against the Rays earlier. Um, but the production isn't there. He's under the Mendoza once again. The on-base is like low 300s. The OPS overall is 600s again. No, it's not there. He only has two home runs. He only has four, RBI- four RBIs. I mean, he's not even bringing that power presence. A D might even be too optimistic. Like, he's not been good. He's been bad. He's been very bad. He's regressed a ton since that lights out year and a half. Then you get to Kyle Higashioka. Listen, this is based off of their own expectation, remember, and I gave him an A-. minus. I think to his expectation, a backup catcher, he has been spectacular so far. Small sample size? Yes unsustainable yeah he's not gonna have a thousand OPS but I, I I get it I get it I get why the Yankees are starting this guy right now he's been catching good the framing's been good he hasn't been a problem yeah the pass balls aren't aren't great with him either but he's been fine in the bats you know he's hitting the ball too his bat has some pop he's even walking a lot more he's got six walks on the season. He had zero walks in the last two seasons. 
So he's been good. He's been producing a double down the line today. He's got some home runs. <laughs> How long does he start? You know, two out of every three games. I don't know. You know, because Cashman did tender Gary the $5 million raise. So I don't think he did that just to bench him the entire year. So I think eventually he's going to make his way back into the everyday guy. Will you though? I don't. If he keeps hitting like shit, and Higgy keeps showing that he's a serviceable player, I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, so far going down the line of catchers, I've got Gary at a D, Higgy at an A minus. Again, this is to their own expectation. Uh, DJ Lemayhew. It sucks, man. I am I being too harsh? I mean, he's been a little bit better lately, but overall, it's been a disappointing first month. You know? I gave him a C plus. Is that too harsh? I feel bad, because I love this guy. But he's not been the DJ we're used to. Now, his defense has been versatile and solid, so maybe I should give him a B minus. I'd even go there. But... I mean, I can't go higher than that. C plus, I'm... And I get nervous when I... Now I'm starting to... It's starting to get to my head because you know, I'm looking into his Colorado numbers. He's had a few years where the OPS was in the 700s or the average was in the 270s. And I'm hoping this isn't one of them. I'm hoping that those two really ridiculous seasons he had as a Yankee, or one and a half, however you want to put it, one and a third. Um, I'm hoping that we get that. I'm hoping we get the guy who can hit over 300. And we get the guy who can have an OPS over 850. We get the guy who strikes out less than 15 fucking percent of the time. We get the guy who can spray the ball around the outfield. Who You know, we get that exciting LeMay who can give you 20 plus homers. That guy hit 300. He's been he's coming here to be an extreme contact hitter who hits at a very high clip and he hasn't done that yet. This year, sorry. He hasn't done that this year. That's why we gave him the contract, but he hasn't done that yet. He's again, he's after today's over 4, he's 269 and I think the OPS is barely in the 700s. The slugging is in like the low 300s to mid 300s. He it's unfortunate. It sucks to see him not exactly be on. He's rolling over a lot of pitches. He's leaving the strike zone. He's swinging early. The timing is a little bit off. Not seeing those line drive hard contact hits. Now he has, again, been better of late. But still not to a point where I can go higher than C+, maybe B-. minus. But DJ LeMayu, final grade so far to his own expectation. Remember, a C+. Plus. Rootnet Odor, uh, C minus, you know, he's picking his spot. He doesn't get a hit a ton. He doesn't hit the ball a ton. He's hitting in the bucks. For somebody who's hitting, what, a buck 50? I can't give him anything. I might be being too nice. Uh, maybe I'm being too nice for a C minus. But the only reason they gave him a C minus and nothing lower is because when he has hit the ball, he's picking his spots and getting some pretty clutch hits. You know, he's been that spark plug type, that swagger he brings um, in those big moments have helped us. C minus. Mike Ford, I couldn't give a grade to him because he hasn't really played much. Um, but Voigt's hopefully coming back soon. So that won't be a problem. He's playing games right now at the alt site. So we'll see what happens there. Glaber. I also gave him a C minus. Um, he too has hit better lately. Especially since that Atlanta game where he was called out for not hustling. He's been picking it up um 333 in his last 10 three doubles defense has cleaned it up to a degree um he made a nice play the other day looking over his shoulder making a slick catch throws are looking a lot sharper but man does he he needs to get that first home run out of the way i mean that is rough to have zero home runs in one month of baseball now you're thinking about it. You're like, how many is he going to end with, even if he gets hot? Because he basically wasted an entire month. 
but that's that's murdering. It's that not having a home run is murdering his slugging percentage, and that's murdering his OPS. Fucking sucks. I thought he could be a guy who hits you 300, anywhere from 275 to 300, and give you an OPS, you know, around 900. But he's heading down that. It's sad. I don't want to say it, but like the same issues with Glaber are the ones that I was always talking about with Gary when when I wanted him, when I still had some hope in him. It's keeping that clean, aggressive, but still focused approach at the plate. And not trying to pull everything off. That was everything we said about Gary. And now look at him. So I'm, I'm, I get a little nervous. I hope he's not heading towards that Gary Sanchez path. Heading down that same exact line. But um, he has looked a lot better lately. He got the rest day today. But I'm sure he'll be back out there for the Houston series. And um, hopefully he can keep it. Keep building off of what he's been doing lately. But C minus, C minus so far. Maybe that's a little harsh. I don't know. I think it was. Um, Gio Urshela, I give him B, a solid B. The only one who's really showed up every night for the CMO so far has been Gio Urshela. Uh, he's 275, 316, 451. Playing great third base defense. They have him playing some shortstop now on days where Torres doesn't play. Um, so you take it. He's been good. He's hitting the homers. He's making contact. He's been Gio Urshela. He has been Gio Urshela. Um, so you take it. It's all relative, right? Because even he has taken a step back from his recent seasons with the Yankees. But it's all relative because you, you have a lot of guys who aren't exactly there yet. Um, but they're coming along. Judge coming along. I gave him a B+. Plus. He's finally hot. The numbers look very judge-like. Now 281, 947, 7 home runs, 18 RBIs. A lot of that's due to his recent, recent hot streak. Right, so I can't, you know, they look like A-plus numbers, but you watch them the entire season. He's had his up and down, so a B-plus is good, though. Uh, the defense looks to me like he's regressed a bit. I haven't looked into the numbers or anything, but just watching it, the eye test, it looks like he's regressed to a degree. But, you know, maybe he's just playing too conservatively because he's always dealing with some kind of injury. Clint Frazier. Um, I don't know, man. These last two great, a couple of grades aren't really great. Clint, I gave a D. He's looked better lately too, more aggressive. No longer spitting on those fastballs down the pipe. Um, but he's walking lately. He's hitting the ball harder. Again, he had the home run the other night. Took it to the warning track, uh, I think this afternoon. But until the results start coming consistently, I can't go higher than the D range. The defense, I'll rem yeah, that also remains not suspect. Very bad. Very bad. Dude lost the ball in the sun in game two. On the first play. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love Clint, but can't exactly say he's been great. Um, and it, it's scary because, like, unless he's absolutely raking, the Yankees probably don't trust this guy. We saw it last season. In the playoffs. They're not going to trust him in the playoff game. Unless he's absolutely. Even if he's raking. Like he had a good season. <laughs> Excuse me. But he didn't really get any at-bats. In October. So he's going to have to. And he hasn't shown any big time improvement. This season defensively. So. I don't know. Aaron Hicks, I give a D. I mean, not much to say. He doesn't look the same. At least the arm doesn't look great. He's still got the good defense. Um, and at the plate, from the left side in particular, he, he can't hit from the left side anymore. I don't know. It's like Nick Swisher all over again. Not looking good. He's hitting a buck fifty-seven, I think. Um, 
The OPS is bad. Not hitting. Can't give him higher than a D. Brett Gardner also gave him a D. Hasn't really done much at all. And last but not least, Giancarlo Stanton. I gave him a B. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, a B minus. I gave Giancarlo a B minus. Um, 271, 810. So, listen, the guy hits the ball 200 miles an hour every time he makes contact. He just sticks the bat out and it flies. Um, he's coming along. He started out looking pretty abysmal. But he's been coming along too, just like Judge. He again, he had three three hit games in a row. Excuse me, but um, I think he's getting there. Yeah. So I, I have B minus so far for him. Can he play the fucking field, please? Can they let him play the field? <laughs> kind of help him get into a rhythm if he's constantly active. I'll probably get into a better rhythm that way. All right, and all in all, I graded the Yankees. Um, listen, fifteen and fifteen, third place. If we were basing this off of the last couple of series, it would be different, right? There would be a lot of A's. A lot of B's, and I would grade the Yankees as a unit somewhere in that area too. But we're basing it off the entire season so far, from April 1st to this last series, which ended on May 2nd. That's what we're basing it off of. So I have to take all that into account. I can't just ignore the rough start because they're playing better now. I have to take everything into account. And so, with that said, taking everything into fucking account, I gave them a flat C. I gave the Yankees a C because 15 and 15 is exactly what that is. It's average. It's mediocre. And to their standards, it's pretty bad. So, they haven't been great. It's a C. But again, if it was the last couple of series, yeah, they'd be A, B, <laughs> no worse. But overall, combine it all together, a C. All right, but it looks like they're headed in the right direction, so we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. All right, one more time, we'll hit the break. Get the plug in one last time. When we get back, we'll get to the MYY MYK question of the day. Hey fellas, so really quick before we get back into the show, I do want to remind you that if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast or subscribed to my blog or followed me on social media even, you can do all that by going to my link tree. Just go to linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. That is linktr.ee slash rjcarbone. Guys, thanks so much. Let's get back to the show. All right, guys. So overall, again, it was a solid series for the Yankees. It was not a team that you looked at and said, the Yankees are back. They're on top of the world again. They're going to win the World Series. No, it was a series where you looked at and said, this is a good starting point. This is how we get back on track. Let's beat up on the bad teams and we'll take care of the rest from here see what's up against Houston. So I can't wait for this series. I know Garrett Cole will be pitching at one point in this set. Um, so if you, if you do the math, I think it's game three. Um, but it's going to be fun seeing him pitch against his former team. Going to be fun seeing the Yankees greet the Astros for the first time since 2019 with the, you know, with fans in the seats. So looking forward to that. Let's get to the NYY NYK question of the day to wrap this thing up.
All right, so last time out in episode 240, we were covering the Knicks. I asked you guys which Nick famously limped onto the court and played injured during Game 7 of the 1970 Finals. The answer to that question, Willis Reed, the captain. Willis Reed did so. I think he only scored like four points, but, you know, it wasn't quite the flu game, but <laughs> it was good. Uh, Willis Reed, um, the captain, famously limped onto the court and played hurt in the NBA Finals Game 7, 1970. Let's get to tonight's NYY NYK question of the day brought to you by Anchor. Best way to get your podcast, go to the Anchor app or download the Anchor app, sorry, or go to anchor.fm. Our question for tonight's episode 241. Which player tied a major league record by appearing in three perfect games, the last two as a member of the New York Yankees? Alright, so one last time. Which player tied a major league record by appearing in three perfect games, the last two as a member of the New York Yankees? So name that player. Alright, guys, thank you so much. Um, again, if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, be sure to do that right now. You can subscribe to BD4 on Apple Podcast. You can do it on Spotify. Um you can watch the video format of this podcast up on YouTube if you're not doing that already. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you stopping by. This is all we've got for Ep 241. I will see you in Ep 242 when we're talking Knicks. Um, if not, I'll see you in the blog. And that'll be that, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate you stopping by once again. One last time, I am your host, RJ Carbone. This is BD4. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'll see you next time. Ciao. This podcast is sponsored by Anchor.